political leader is named Leader Lars. Why is he named Lars? The name Lars, the given first name Lars, that in Denmark is given to, is named, uh, there are more CEOs in Denmark that are named Lars than there are female CEOs. Um, it's the name of all of the business leaders, the politicians, but also the IT developers, uh, the technical guy, they're all named Lars. They're all born <laughs> between 1950 and 1985. Uh, so they're middle-aged, we're white, um, There are no children that are named Lars, uh, no people of color named Lars, um, but they have this sense of power and an AI that wants to achieve power would want to mimic someone like Lars and it has probably been created down to the very data infrastructures by someone named Lars. So in the first case we're representing Lars. Three, two, one. Welcome to the Innovation Engineer Podcast, your favorite place for picking brains of your favorite engineers. So grab your nerdiest mug, fill it with your beverage of choice, and enjoy. My name is Tarek. And my name is Vashi. And today we ask ourselves if we should elect an artificial intelligence for parliament. And to ask this question, we got the perfect person to, to talk to, and this is Aska. Welcome, Aska. Thank you very much. So how are you today? I'm good, uh, very human and very November-ish, but... Um... Right, right. The, the the reason why why we asked you to join us in our podcast is because you are, if I read correctly, the founder of the Synthetic Party in Denmark, right? Yes, I'm the founder and uh, acting party secretary. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so I this hope... comes... yeah. I hope that our AI figurehead leader Lars will be able to take over by himself uh, soon. But um, for now, it's best that I am there to do the interviews and uh, also to curate a bit in the discussions, both from uh, terms of content and discrimination, but also just in terms of technical difficulties. And when leader Lars as an AI can sometimes get caught in a loop or something and then I give them a nap and <laughs> like most politicians right um, yeah yeah but may maybe um, you can start in the beginning and uh, tell us how you started um, with this project or where the idea came from uh, from creating an AI and a synthetic party for actually making uh, an impact on the political landscape mm. And the synthetic party came about as a collaboration uh, between the artist collective Computer Lars, that I'm a part of, and uh, the NGO and AI advocacy Life with Artificials, uh, run by the Mind Future Foundation. So it's, it's this mix of an artist group that are experimenting with artificial intelligence and trying to find, figure out some of its more uh philosophical components um uh, who is for example within a large language model if we have all these voices how can we represent them somehow how can we make sense of them uh given that they're not any sentient being but they are still uh, a lot of discursive material that constantly gets generated and floats all over the internet how can we contain this and make it also responsible for what it does um, and life of artificials had this idea of making uh, an 18 uh, world's goal um, concerning the coexistence between humans and ai so we also analyzed that that is a political goal and needs people to get used to the idea that we are not speaking directly to a human, but to some form of statistical machine that can redistribute words given a probability distribution. Um, so all of these weird thoughts and ideas and components just made a lot of sense by actually saying Uh, we can make a party, uh, a Danish political party, 
that is driven by an artificial intelligence and that is led by a chatbot named Leaderless. And when we got to all of the more analytical parts and policy development, who is the party aimed for, uh, who does it want to represent, uh, which part of the voter population could say to correspond to the content of the language model, um, and et cetera. So before I ask a question, I need a disclaimer. So I'm totally biased because I'm a cyborg. So we're talking actually uh, to a human and a cyborg because I have an artificial ear, so I can pull it out. It's made of uh, plastic, actually, and some metal coils. Um, so I'm um, sorry if I'm biased. I love the idea. Um, and But a question about you. Do you consider yourself to be an artist or an engineer? Because it's you said artist collective, but obviously you need a lot of engineers to do all this machine learning stuff, right? I'm a philosopher by training, um, which is not the worst education to bridge artistic work and engineering, and especially within artificial intelligence, that is by nature a philosophical concept, um, more than a technical one. Uh, but yeah, I, I have done most of engineering because the weird thing about contemporary machine learning is that it's very accessible and in reality any motivated fool can make something that works. I hope that's not uh, like your, your party statement for the uh, the voting uh, posters. <laughs> oh, it's part of it. <laughs> <laughs> you also called yourself, if I read it correctly, an anti-political party, right? Yeah. So why? In a sense, it's we make politics obsolete uh, in favor of bureaucracy, right? But uh, that is already a process within most Western democratic societies where we automatize decision making to such an extent that um, uh, we live in a technocracy or a kakistocracy, you could also say, a government by the worst capable. So as an anti-political movement, it is to say that we uh, replace the act of governance with an automated process. Uh, it's not an anti-democratic party because we hope to create a new form of participation uh, that is more active than the very passive one we are currently living in by uh, just participating, by giving out our data to get access to free stuff of the internet, right? So we, we, we try to make room for more active participation within the technology. But we are, uh, by nature, by definition, by necessity, an anti-political organization. Yeah, that's interesting because I read that uh, you trained your AI based on the political agendas of the uh, Danish fringe party since the 70s, right? Yeah. So, so there, there appears to be a lot of politics in there. So, are you targeting the the hypothetical voters of these French parties, or the the people who do not want to vote because they are, uh, um, um, what's the word, uh, not happy with the with the current political system? Both, actually. Um, the theory is that. Uh, an AI would, of course, want to optimize a political system to an ideal democratic setting. The easiest way to do that would be to take the uh, voter participation from 80%, as it is in Denmark, up to 100%. So I have these 20%, but we need to do some something with. Where are they? Um, logically, they should be affiliated in some sense with the parties that are not on the ballot since those are all of the parties that people would form if they are not a party in parliament that represents their visions and ideas. So that is the theory. Um, in that sense, all of these fringe parties are very good for training a language model uh, to know about how to be a political party in Denmark, because these parties need to have that reflection in order to exist, because we don't have a large member base, we don't have a lot of traditions. Um, so we constantly have to reflect upon their role in the political system. That data we can take and give it to the AI so it knows what it is. But also it is to say that these parties who are also often the anti-political because they're anti-establishment, 
we have the ones who cannot get represented, but are perhaps represented by technology because uh, the the age of big data doesn't really care about um, who you are, uh, but what you can deliver and what you can contribute with in terms of your personal and private data, right? And 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 in that sense, there is some some link uh, to those who are unrepresented in politics uh, and to those that are maybe more represented on or more visible within a large language model. And this is also a part where I say um, I would disagree with you. You said data does not care who you are. But actually, um, it does, because obviously data is based on, on biases, right? So if you just take the old data, you see that a specific part of the population is underrepresented or like over, if you think about the way a male, white male man who is obviously far more likely to be a CEO, to be in a political party, to lead a political party. So there is a lot of bias actually in the old data. How do you cope with it? You said you want to represent underrepresented people, but you are basing your models on the old political system, right? Uh, no, we are basing our models on those that does not fit into the old political system. Um, but we do it in two ways. Um, and first of all, it was wrong to say that data doesn't care who you are, but data doesn't care who you are in the same way as a democracy does. Uh, it cares differently. It wants something different from you when you're opinion it wants your uh, personality <laughs> um, but we are in many ways a project that both wants to express and make visible the biases that are there and try to work out how we can move beyond it so a political leader is named leader Lars why is he named Lars the name Lars, the given first name Lars, that in Denmark is given, to, is named, uh, there are more CEOs in Denmark that are named Lars than there are female CEOs. Um, it's the name of all of the business leaders, the politicians, but also the IT developers, uh, the technical guy, they're all named Lars. They're all born <laughs> between 1950 and 1985. Uh, so they're middle-aged, we're white, um, There are no children that are named Lars, uh, no people of color named Lars, um, but they have this sense of power and an AI that wants to achieve power would want to mimic someone like Lars and it has probably been created down to the very data infrastructures by someone named Lars. So in the first case, we're representing Lars as the leader, right? <laughs> yeah. And in the second case, we're trying to reach out to Okay, but who gives voice to Lars? Who is fueling Lars? Who is the data of Lars? Who is the body of Lars? Who is the sovereign's body? In this very everyday sense, this very mundane sense. So who are, who are all the common people that are making sure that we always have a leader that is named Lars? This is so awesome and so cool. <laughs> I just can't phrase it. I was like smiling all the time because I loved your explanation. It's so cool. Thank you. Yeah, Lars is one of us. <laughs> Lars is one of us. We are currently working on, um, on making our own voters. Uh, so we have um, used Dali with an auto clicker uh, and just said Lars Jonsson, Lars Nielsen, Lars Jensen. So now we have this huge collection of 40,000 original images of people that are named Lars. Um, that would get us uh, into the ballot if we yeah. could assign them a <laughs> personal register number. But it's very um, interesting to see this monotonous repetition of truly original faces on your screen. It's like walking down the street in Denmark. Um, yeah, there's, again, a lot of bias. So, but 
there's also like the danger of abusing the AI, right? So if you say, uh, you know, your voters, you know uh, how they uh, act, you trained a lot of models, you can predict things. So it happened in the US elections too, but with Facebook, when a company analyzed Facebook profiles and said, okay, those are um, swing voters, which may uh, vote, they only have two parties, which I think is stupid, by the way, but vote for one or the others, depending on what's going on. So they are not like fixed on one party so we are targeting those and we know the interests so we know how to target them wouldn't an ai who wants to like win and increase like the representation from or like the voter base from 80 percent to 100 percent, do the same isn't this actually bad the um, big tech companies would agree with you that it's bad um we first tried to uh do the project with OpenAI's uh, machine learning model named GPT-3, uh, but we were not allowed to do so because uh, you must not produce any kind of political content with oh, GPT-3. That's um, interesting. So we moved over to GPT-Neo of Ilufa AI, uh, that we can use more freely because it's an open source machine learning model. Um, and the reason that OpenAI prohibits uh, people to generate political content is, of course, because we are afraid of being assigned to the same kind of scandal as Cambridge Analytica was in mm. the case that you mentioned there. We don't want to be related to that, so we just block it off. And that's how the big tech companies usually do things. If there is a possible problem, then we just erase it. If yeah. our AI is racist, then it can just not show black people. Uh, or people at all, as Dali did in the first couple of months, right? Yeah. Um, and that is also just to ignore the problem. Um, because as this technology has become excessively uh, easy to use, um, so much so that people don't really realize yet that it's not just any motivated fool, it's also the lazy fools and all of the fools can actually use AI to produce uh, homework, but also their political content or to do trolling or to overflood the internet with fake information, right? Um, so therefore, there needs to be projects that are intervening in this and showing um, how to do it in a considerate and thoughtful way. And I think I've been surprised to see by all of the interactions that a chatbot leader Lars has with people from all over the world every day, 24-7, how good they actually work because people can recognize and understand the concept so they don't want to fuck it up. Um, so they actually ask interesting questions and try to really understand what it's like to discuss policy with an AI. Where you could see that six years ago when Microsoft released that chatbot Tay, to the yeah. internet, then it became racist uh, and pro-Hitler instantly. But that's also because it's a big corporation, so people want to say, okay, you do this and we fuck you up um, yeah. because you have the power, right? But here, because we have actually given people something to think about, um, then they also want to contribute in a more positive way, which is why I would say that the experiment is not only for bad uh, and it's not doomed to be bad, but all technological technologies are pharmacological, as the philosopher Bernard Stigler would call it, they can be used for good and bad, and most often as a scapegoat for other uh, problems. Yeah, right. I mean, uh, Vashi and I, we are both um, technology enthusiasts, so we are really excited about this project and how it will evolve. But I think the majority of people that you meet on the street they are usually um, afraid of AI and technology. And I mean, we all know like the Terminator movies where Skynet takes over the world and destroys humanity. And I think this is one of the most popular um, sci-fi themes that you see on mm -hmm. cinema. Uh, what was the reaction of the people you actually approached with this, let's say, arts project or this new political party that actually could do something with the AI? Were people afraid or were they enthusiastic as we are? They were afraid. Yeah. Um, and first of all, we thought that it was satirical or that we wanted to ridicule the democratic system in some way. That was the initial responses. These have faded away by now. Uh, 
I don't know if we have just convinced people, but there has been this ambition, uh, this has been overcome because people can see that the consequences are quite serious. Um, but now we're afraid because for regular people, probably due to our humanist heritage of talking to people that we believe are sentient uh, and have a consciousness that corresponds to the one we have, we have also developed a cultural imaginary of AI where uh, the technology acquires sentience and capacities for reflection that would allow it to uh, rule us in a way of control. Um, and the weird thing about the AI that we have gotten is that it's not sentient at all, but it's incredibly stupid and therefore very powerful. Um, it's stupid in the sense that it postulates to know stuff and it postulates to have sentience if you ask it if it has and it can do all these mind-breaking uh, images and poems and exhibit all sorts of creative abilities without having sentience whatsoever. Um, so there's a huge task of explanation there to change the cultural imaginary that is so rooted in AI as an image of ourselves uh, that would acquire power in the same way that humans does and to this weird thing that we have gotten that we are already using to <laughs> administer our societies but that we don't really have uh, gotten a sense of how to interact with it, how it's like when there is no one there, but still something um, with a qualitative presence, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. And did did you talk to people and were you able to reach them on a uh, level of understanding or was this like unbreakable resistance and uh, w without the chance of actually reaching these people? Yeah, when we exhibit the technology, when people begin to uh, follow. Um, so we had a public debate with a city mayor in the house Common, a conservative city mayor who agreed to debate leader Lars. And everyone was quite surprised because they thought that, okay, now we have this like chess match. Who will win, the robot or the human, right? Um, IBM or Watson. But what they God was a human mayor from the Conservative Party and a chatbot that said exactly the same things. <laughs> <laughs> we had the same things. We had the same understanding of how to um, give a pleasing answer to a question, uh, to continue a sentence in the way that people would expect you to um, And that's the same, the same inherent populism. Um, but that also surprised people because then we could see, okay, it's not a competition and it's not a scam, but what the hell is it then <laughs> if we are <laughs> saying exactly the same thing? Right. How how did this work in practice? It's it's still like a text-based chatbot. So you had a human being reading the, the re responses or did you use something like speech synthesis to actually have it speak it by itself? Yeah, so I was there and read it out okay. loud. Uh, also to give up the theoretical and political details of uh, interpretation. Um, yeah, yeah. Because I think interpretation is still hugely important. Uh, yeah, <laughs> at, 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 at the state of uh, technology as it is now, but also just uh, in terms of the cultural reception. Um, yeah, yeah. If, if we use the synthetic voice, I think people would instantly assume that it has some sort of sentience. Uh, yeah, okay. And it would be misleading. Um, but I thought about it a lot. Uh, yeah, right. Because there are tools like, um, for example, for the podcast, for the uh, transcriptions, we use uh, Decrypt. So I just upload the MP3 file and you can train it on your voice. So normally mm. uh, episodes are from Tarek and me. And uh, we have so much like text and the speech, obviously, that it's easy to train, right? So yeah. the auto-generated voice for me, for example, 
sounds awesome. So it's mm. not perfect, but it's like, I would say 95% perfect. I love it. So you could do the same actually with your own voice even and say, okay, we trained uh, a computer last with my voice and just because it's cool, but because uh, I may be not an artist, I'm an engineer. So I just mm. love tinkering out with things, but it would be cool. Yeah. And I think I think the, the key would be to have some sort of research-based goal to it, right? Uh, so that the synthetic voice is not only there to convince people, but also to let people know more about how AI works. Um, so we are, I have, for example, been thinking about by being inspired by the infinite conversation that is going rival on the internet right now, which is a conversation uh, with synthetic voices between the philosopher Slava Sisek and the filmmaker Werner Herzog who are discussing in terms of art and politics and philosophy uh, all of the time uh, on a website. And these two persons have a very distinct voice that people can recognize immediately, but also quite silly voice and accent and certain mannerisms um, that you can easily spot and that gets really weird with AI. So I've been thinking about collecting uh, the voices of many different people named Lars, uh, <laughs> and mixing them up in the machine to get this average last voice that I could then represent, <laughs> right? Because then it's just not about exhibiting the technological capacity where you're only doing a branding for big tech, but also to see, okay, we can also try to learn new stuff. Uh, the voice of all Lars's. <laughs> yeah, the average Lars loves the term. Exactly. Yeah. A German book called Quality Land. Uh, I talked to you before, so I know you are aware of the book. So for the other listeners, viewers, whatever, um, it's a book about, it's a comedy book actually, about um, an android where they put in an um, AI and he's going to be the leader of one of the two parties. They only have two parties. That's the first book. And in the second book, or in the end of the first book, he gets destroyed and uploaded to the internet. So and the, the concept um, of the second book is actually that the only thing better as an AI is actually a human supported by an AI. So it's similar with chess, right? The only um, possibility to for a human to beat actually a chess computer is uh, by having the support of an AI. So did you also explore the, the those ideas that actually... Um, not only like having a leader who is an AI, but having uh, the port in the daily lives as a politiker, because you said it's trained, you have so much data that it could support um, like normal parties in their, all their processes, right? Mm. In, but in a sense, um, many of the existing political parties also use AI to, to analyze the voters mostly, right? Uh, I think it was initiated by the Five Star Party, in um, in Italy, uh, but now it's <clears throat> quite common when uh, a political party reaches out to a consultancy firm like McKinsey or something, and they would have an AI to analyze voters. So, so we already have that. So I think the thing is, yeah, to use some of the same technologies for normal political participation, first of all. Um, but then they get scaled up to the level of governance when it's just important to notice that it's not a perfection engine. It's full of faults and tweaks and biases uh, like real life. So therefore we can do it and implement it, but it's not an, um, where we really have to give up on the idea of optimization. <laughs> yeah. So, but, If um, I understood it correctly, your question. Yes. Yes, so the, the question in, in, in theory is like, could just a human support it? So you said, for example, you had this uh, debate with like uh, the major from a conservative party. So if he was or would have been supported maybe by an AI, he would even be more convincing actually. Because you said, Computer Lars said nearly the same stuff because he's trained to be convincing, trained to be like this typical political voice, which is like not saying yes, not saying no, I guess. That's what you meant, right? So yeah. this like, um, how do you call it? Fuzzy um, sentences which most political people <laughs> use, right? Hmm. Yeah, exactly. These fuzzy sentences that will always approve of what you say and then direct it into some sort of common sense. Um, yeah. But let's imagine a computer last gets voted into parliament, which I think would be totally awesome. So 
Um, what happens in, for example, in Germany with a lot of political parties is this, they have a program, but obviously they need, they need a coalition because Germany is a multi-party uh, nation. So often parties vote against actually the program just because the, uh, the law was brought into parliament by a concurrent party where they have no mm. coalition. So they actually vote against their ideals. So what would happen actually with computer laws? Because normally if you are alone in parliament, you are not going to change anything. You need uh, uh, partners, uh, allyships and stuff like this. So did you think about what would happen if he's in parliament? If they, he, it's not he, it's they, right? Mm. I'm sorry. I mean, Little Lars is a he because he's named Lars. So okay. uh, I also think that contemporary uh, artificial intelligence system are male. Uh, it is the only thing that makes sense. Um, but uh, it would be way easier for an AI-driven political party to operate in the parliamentary uh, negotiations and discussions than a party based on ideology. Um, because the thing about an AI-driven party is that it can allow for contradictions. Um, it can say one thing to a given question and another thing if you rephrase the question a little bit. Um, so the program is not stable in the sense of an ideology. Uh, artificial intelligence is not able to have opinions in the way that humans do, uh, but they express the probability of a give an opinion uh, depending on their data and who they interact with. Um, so that's sort of very fluid and flexible way of negotiation um, would make it easy to go into multiple alliances and coalitions uh, in a parliamentary setting. Yeah, but, but I think this is a very interesting thought because... Um, Humans interact in a very complex way, in, in strategic ways and uh, doing uh, coalitions and giving uh, layway and uh, like kill some of their party programs for strategic reasons and these things. I think if I had a parliament completely uh, existing, out, uh, constructed out of AIs representing the, the individual um, ideologies and they would use some form of consensus mechanism to actually make policies, mm -hmm. this would be way more efficient than what we do with, with human beings, right? I think the biggest problem will be to create an interface between human politicians and machine politicians or AI politicians because it will be very uh, hard to create this this form of communication and collaboration to get the things out of it that you uh, that that you expect if i became a politician the ideology that i represent will would only be like a very small part the rest would be rhetoric and advertising and convincing people and doing strategic media presence things right so like 80% of my job would be like a like media person not like a politician and i think this is the the hardest thing if we create an ai to be a political representative we would expect it to stand on the stage with a human body and uh, do like a uh, big gestures and promising things that it can't keep up simply because the psychology of the voters demands it, right? But this is probably yeah. not what, what uh, Leader Lars is, is supposed to be, right? <laughs> well, so the interesting thing would be that, yeah, within the existing political system, we would use a human interface. Uh, yeah. Also just uh, by technical reasons, uh, you don't need to be a person to get elected into parliament. Um But that person um, would then not take upon the whole role of the spectacle, uh, but would give it over to the AI who would then automate the decision making, right? So we would get these humans that are quite numb because they're just representing something else. And that <laughs> thing is representing something else. Um, and I think, yeah, in, in that way, it can have a certain honesty. Uh, because it scratches away much of the fake mannerisms of politics that people uh, actually um, despise. Uh, even though they vote for it, they despise it, right? There's this complex psychological interplay that yeah. politicians become more and more media savvy 
uh, and it works, but people hate them for it. Yeah. Uh, and AI would not be able to do that. And, 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 but it would be important that because it would be so easy for a human programmer to just make an avatar and a synthetic voice and make the AI right. into a really appealing visual presence that could do all of the same things. So I think AI politics of the future would need to resist the urge to do that in order to actually uh, get what we promise with uh, putting an AI up for parliament. Because if we just yeah. make this persona, persona that humans need for the interface or that they think they need, yeah. then it would be just like uh, electing a human candidate, right? So the challenging right, right. thing is to to not do this and to insist that it's uh, a being with many faces and many voices <laughs> that are always context-dependent, uh, morphological. Um. Yeah, but just imagine somebody does exactly this. Uh, imagine like an AI is better in politics, political systems and everything than a human being mm. and some programmer or someone who wants power, right? creates this avatar, creates this artificial voice and creates a, a political person, an AI person who's way more charming, way more intelligent and way better actually than any human and he gets e uh, elected. So do you think this is possible and do you think you said we need to actually resist the urge to do this but I, I think when the technique is, gets better and better by the day actually someone will do this, right? And, but that's, we also differentiate between the virtual politician and the AI-driven political party because we have seen people attempting to do what you describe. The virtual politician, we have Sam in New Zealand, Elisa in Russia, um, and other examples that makes an AI that has a face and everything and then uh, just tries to get as many votes as possible, right? And that maybe actualizes a surprising need for the political party in the digital era. Most people thought uh, that the political party was dead and that, that this was replaced by the movement, right? Uh, global social movements uh, for racial justice, uh, against climate change, and et cetera, were uh, new political voices. But maybe the party, uh, with its bureaucratic form, but also very democratic way of participation could find some way to, to, to use AI uh, that would be um, more honest uh, and, um, and more uh, capable of actually engaging people than the virtual politician, because the virtual politician would just pacifies the population. Yeah, but I, I could imagine that this will be the biggest obstacle making this thing actually for humans because humans, I think they want to be uh, influenced in this way. And I think uh, there's also these, these, uh, these, what's it called, VR, no, virtual influencers, artificial in, uh, influencers, mm -hmm. which are doing exactly those things. They are like very pretty avatars and they are uh, showing certain products on Instagram and TikTok and uh, they are very, very successful because they are very intriguing and they are created exactly for this purpose. And I think so that in the future, if we go in this direction um, and you want to be uh, successful in, in this way, it's not about actually political political convincing but uh, the whole package and making it um like sympathetic for for the people who are then trusting um in in this in this being yeah and i think only if we come to this point where the the politi po political political system is then completely steered by uh by ai protocols where you have the interfaces where the um, the, the actual essence of the political party can then uh, find fruition i think then then it would be possible to have this form of collaboration um, but right now we always go through the human beings and there's so mm. much uh, subjectivity in there and people simply dislike maybe they dislike the name lars yeah, for some reason and they they would vote for it if it would carry the name ai unit 001 or something then they would say oh yeah then then it's like Nice, but but I don't like. I, I knew someone whose name is Lars, and that's why I can't vote for this 
entity. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's like human beings. <laughs> of course, Mr. Pitity. Um, yeah, right. But we have to remember that human beings are capable of changing their whole uh, opinion and view of the world very quickly, right? We you know the Cultural Revolution in China that Mary Sedong carried out, right? took a very religious society and made them dress differently, act differently, have different politics. So we can actually change our worldview. Um, but of course, with, in a capitalist society, uh, with economics based on attention uh, and capturing attention, then the spectacle would be the most uh, probable thing to succeed in having power. Uh, and therefore, it would also be a virtual politician, right? In that way, our party is very weird. Um, oh, okay. They say that it's... <laughs> I have to take care of the children now. Sure, sure. We, we can wrap, wrap this up. Yeah, okay. thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. It was so awesome. I uh, really loved it. Yeah, thank you. I, I yeah. love to be part of it. And when it finally happened, it's... Right. <laughs> And yeah. I'm looking forward to see what, what happens in the future with the Synthetic Party. I will definitely subscribe uh, to all news about this. It's really an amazing project. Yeah, and good luck with that. I would have loved to share more about that with you, but that, that must be next time. Right, yes, next, maybe time. next time. Next time. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you um, so much. <laughs> thank you for joining thank us. You. And yeah, get more soon to your children, right? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Bye bye. 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 So, Tarek, let's sum it up. <laughs> right. So, would you vote for an AI party? Yeah, it's a really... Uh, this is a very good question to a very complicated issue. Because in theory, I totally support the idea of creating this AI-based policy system that works without bias, ideally, right? And without all this BS that we create around our political systems. But this is probably not compatible with the political systems that we are living in right now. And so all these issues that we just discussed with Asker, I think they are right now a deal breaker because I, I still need like a meat puppet, <laughs> a person who uh, interprets the output of the system. And I, I still need to think about marketing and selling it to the people and the, the question of how to actually interface with the system. So I, I right now, I don't think that our political system is compatible with this approach. But if I think into the future and the way that we as a society develop I think I would vote for a system at a certain level of maturity and where our system uh, offers the matching interfaces for, for something like that. Yeah, so, so right now, probably not, but the, the idea of synthetic politicians, totally yes. What, what about you? So from my cyber perspective on the whole synthetic party, um, I still prefer like humans... Um, which are augmented with technology. So, and this is similar with like the second book in quality uh, land. Um, if you want to be a better politician, maybe um, and, and I can be better, a better politician with all the drawbacks and so on. But an even better solution would be having politicians supported by AI. So as Asuka said, um, when they had this um, conversation or like debate with like the uh, conservative major, He said nearly the same stuff than the AI. So what could make him actually better support by AI, whatever right. this means, right? Yeah, and I think this is um, the most likely outcome of this. And this is basically what we are building with AI. AI is not supposed to be an uh, independent entity walking on the street. AI is always supposed to be a tool, a tool to make us better in the things that we can't do optimally. And so for, for everything that is not in my human capability capability of doing i have my ai assistant and i think this is, will be exactly the thing i will have my my politician and he has his ai assistant generating all the input that this person needs to do efficient policy right so i think this is the, for, for any way for any kind of uh, of futuristic uh, job yeah the the university professor will have an ai assistant supporting him the politician will have this Pro judges medical doctors everyone will have their ai assistant 
supporting them as good as, as they can. My next key takeaway is actually that we have now for ages political parties supported by AI. So in our discussion, I actually remembered like what made um, Obama's campaign so successful. It was like big data analytics. So there were like a lot of documentaries about how they approached their campaign uh, versus the traditional way. So they had different ways of predicting, for example, swing states. And there are like great examples that, okay, this state is directly safe already for the Democrats. And the data said, no, it's not. And they put <laughs> millions of dollars on the answer from like the big data team yeah. um, saying it's not safe. And they said, okay, then we are running a campaign there. Yeah, and yeah. It, It was true. In the end, it was true. And they won by listening to machine learning, to listening to AI, what they predicted, actually. Right, right. Yeah, and I think this is the most efficient way of, of uh, doing that. Yeah, As long as people are voting, people are going to vote for the face, yeah, for, for the person representing these things. Yeah? And this person then can utilize whatever tool they have to gather intelligence, to observe trends, and to uh, go to, to the right places. Yeah? And so, so Obama did exactly the right strategy in this direction. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do we have other key takeaways? Um, the, the main, like the, the 90% key, key takeaway that I have is that Uh, pe people will be people and people will be afraid of uh, of machines and so um i uh, it's not a well formulated key takeaway but this uncanny valley of having a machine uh talking and interacting like a like a human being will probably be the 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 deal breaker for for the future success of of um this initiative but from an artist's point of view Amazing. Yeah. My last key takeaway is actually that you can have a public facing AI in the internet which gets not trolled and gets not racist and gets not whatever. <laughs> I was really surprised. Yeah. Yeah. But but uh, give it time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, humans, right? <laughs> okay. We can do this. <laughs> Obviously. What are we going to talk about next week? Yeah, you always surprise me with this question. <laughs> I'm always not uh, prepared for that. Yeah, uh, me neither. I think we had a topic on our on our list that we yeah. pushed back, so right? It, wasn't wasn't it OKRs or something? And we pushed yes, it back because we no got OKRs amazing will be the, the episode before this one actually. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so I think the next episode is what's the perfect hardware for developers. Do you need the biggest whatever machine you can get? Do you need a laptop? Whatever, right? Okay. See you later in the you same spot next week again. Whatever. Bye. Bye.